10 o'clock, is it from 10 to 11 they have those workshops? No, they have them back to back to back, all the way through, 10 to 11. Good morning. Uh, this morning we are going to be going over um, ways to assist you as parents to fund or help fund your child's education. Um, how many of you here have had or currently have a child in college? Anyone? So, as you can attest, colleges are very expensive, no matter where they are, whether it's a state school, or out of state, or private school, some are more expensive than others, but it is indeed a very daunting um, thought to start paying these bills. And we're going to talk a little bit about, my part is kind of an overview and talking about some of the terms that you will hear in the financial aid process. And then we'll kind of get into it in a little bit more detail and at the end provide you with some resources to find scholarships and things outside the realm of um, the actual colleges. So we like to start with a few um, warnings, if you will. Uh, the first one is we are not financial advisors. We are college counselors and guidance counselors. And so 
The information we are providing you is based on what we know as far as the education system. Everyone's going to have a different situation depending on the, your personal financial situation. So if you currently have someone that is your financial advisor, um, that might be the most appropriate person to ask those very specific questions of account, accounts that have numbers and letters attached to them and all kinds of uh, rules attached to them. So just um, that. <coughs> Second thing. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is we have seen a rise in the last, I want to say, three years in companies that not only are seeking your business as far as doing college counseling outside, but are also providing um, guidance in the funding, scholarship, search process. And they make some pretty um, lofty statements of what they can achieve. And so we would like you to be very aware of what those companies are. They are companies that are trying to get your business. And so if you get something that you are contemplating maybe using, it can often be very expensive. Um, my suggestion would be you might want to ask one of us if it's worth it, and usually the response is going to be, no, it's not. They guarantee things that no one can guarantee, and I've had a few families pay some pretty high fees and be very unhappy with the results. So, something we just want you to be aware of, we're not telling you absolutely not, I'm sure there are companies out there that are reputable, but just please beware and be careful of that, and we are here you know, to offer our advice on that if that comes across your um, desk. Okay. So college costs, for those of you that have started or have kids in college or started looking at the, we like to call it the sticker price on colleges, um, we all know that it can be really expensive. So there's basically two costs that we use to determine what you're paying for in college. The direct costs, of course, are things like um, tuition, fees, those kind of things, um, housing, most if they're not living at home, you're going to have housing costs. And then we have the indirect costs, which are all the incidentals, which seem to add up you know, very rapidly as well. Books are very expensive um, on the college level. They're expensive here. They get even more expensive when you move on to college. I know. It's like, you're like, how can it be more expensive? But it is. Um, transportation. If your child is not living you know, you know, at a drivable distance from home, the reality is you are going to be paying for airfare back and forth. And then the thought of if you can only afford to do that once a semester, you know, is your child okay being that far away from home? Or are you okay with your child being that far away from home? Which is usually the bigger issue, right? So, okay. So, so those two things together, your direct cost and your indirect cost, are what constitutes the cost of attendance and the whole formula that exists for um, financial aid. Okay, and again, the cost varies from college to college on what the actual tuition is. So we have schools that can be anywhere for all of this, you know, upwards of sixty thousand dollars a year, and some that are more in the twenty to thirty. Okay, I know it's very depressing and scary, right? Okay, so this is another term that you frequently hear, and it's called the expected family contribution. And when you look on some websites, they don't even bother to explain it to you. It just says EFC, like you're supposed to know what it means. So I want to take a second to explain to you what that is. And basically, it is the amount that once you calculate um, on the FAFSA, which is the government form that is sent to any college that you are requesting financial aid from, it is basically saying that after we've taken into consideration everything you make, your debt, your property holdings, businesses, assets. This is what we are saying you can contribute every year to your child's college education. Now, as a parent who's gone through this process, um, the expected family contribution is always startling. Because <laughs> you're like, I don't have that laying around. Like, I use that to pay bills, or I use that to, you know, to live off of. So that can be you know, disconcerting oftentimes, but this is why we're going to give you some advice, as, you know, to find out some outside sources to help, you know, kind of fund that part of it, 
okay? And then there is sometimes, depending on the student's financial um, situation with most of our students, this is not a, um, an issue, but if the student has funds, um, the student contribution to their education as well. Okay, so this, like I said, is calculated from the FAFSA form, which is a form that every parent will fill out. This is done in their senior year in January. So for those of you that have seniors, this will be something that we will remind you of closer to January. And for the rest of you, you don't have to worry about it yet, but just know it's coming. It looks really similar, the questions they ask, to your, to your tax return. Okay, and you, actually they reference lines in... Your, your tax return. And so it's not, I won't say it's not time consuming or horrible, but there are worse things in life. So it just takes a little time making sure you have all your stuff together to do that. Um, so the expected family contribution is always going to stay the same at every college, no matter the cost at the college. Okay? So, the, so what they expect you, if you're going to a um, college that costs 30000 more than another one, the expected family contribution is going to remain the same and therefore your need-based aid might go up at a college that is more expensive. Okay, so that's where you get your cost of attendance and you will subtract your expected family contribution and that will equal your financial aid. Okay, so financial aid is a term that we use very loosely, and it actually refers to a lot of different things, okay? Um, so it is the funds that a student and family help to um, pay for their college expenses. So the main types of financial aid that we're going to kind of touch on today briefly are scholarships, grants, loans, or something we'll talk a little bit about more in detail. And then employment opportunities are often those are referred to as work study programs. So those are the four main types of funding for college um, education. So scholarships. These are the thing that probably parents know most about or you hear the most about. Great thing about a scholarship is it does not have to be paid back. So it's not a loan when that money is awarded um, to the student, that money is awarded and not expected to be repaid. So that's why they're awesome, right? Okay, so those are the things we want to look for. So we have two different like main types of scholarships. The first one are institutional scholarships. And those are ones given by that particular college. So every college, whether they're state or private, has scholarship funds to award. Now, some schools have way more in scholarship funding to give out than other schools. Typically, state schools that are already affordable for a lot of families do not have as much money to hand out in scholarships. And that is why often during the college search process, we are encouraging you all to apply to private schools even though the sticker price on them can sometimes be very scary but those are the schools that many, many, many times have far more scholarships to award, where in the end, you're getting a private school education for a public school price because of the scholarships they were able to offer to kind of offset that cost. And so when the decision-making process comes, of course, if the funding isn't there, the scholarships don't come in, you know, that's a decision you'll make as a family, but we don't want you not to explore those options. Okay, so those are institutional scholarships, and they can be based on many things. Okay, so oftentimes we throw around the term merit-based aid. Merit-based aid can be anything from, obviously, your grades. Okay, so that's the one I think we most think about. Well, they're not going to get any merit-based aid at, you know, but merit-based aid can be your test scores. Okay, my youngest son actually got a very nice size scholarship to go to school because of his SAT scores. And I didn't even know that existed. <coughs> no, really. And I it was surprised. So sometimes, you know, the grades can help. The test scores um, can help. And then it can be something, a skill, a unique characteristic. So it can be for dance. It can be for band. It can be for art. Um, it could be um, a leadership 
role. There are many schools that are religious-based that give um, community service scholarships. Okay, so don't don't think just because you know your son or daughter is not president of the class or they don't have a four point you know three GPA that there are not options out there for them to get merit-based aid. And that is also why in this college search process we're encouraging students to look at schools that are, we call them safety to target schools, which means that that student's GPA exceeds the average GPA of that school. And the reason being that those are the schools where that student is very likely to get merit-based aid. Okay, if they want your student to come there because they see them as a very strong student in the academic realm or in the leadership realm where they have a talent that they want, you will be surprised at all the money they might find for you and it might be a thousand here and two thousand here and a five thousand, you know, provost scholarship, but those all add up and can make it affordable for, um, for you guys. Okay, athletic, also one we hear a lot about, so those are division one. Schools, Division II, that can offer scholarships, but I will also give you this bit of advice. Division III schools can't offer athletic scholarships, but they can offer merit-based scholarships, and they really are athletic scholarships. So don't, don't discount that if you have a child that is playing, and oftentimes, you know, athletes, Division I is a very very lofty goal for any high school athlete. And yes, we have many students that, you know, that are able to play at that. But the majority of high school athletes are not going to be Division I athletes anywhere. So that is often an in at a school where the student may not get in just on their academics alone, but based on their athletic or even dance or fine arts skills, they might be admitted. So don't discount those as well. Outside scholarships, those are the things, you know, you hear about all these unclaimed money, you know, not being, you know, used, and so I don't, I don't know where those are. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. Because we get, you know, our kids here apply to a lot of scholarships. So they can be through, we have many parents that work for companies that have their own scholarship program, so maybe ask your HR department if you work for a medium to large size company. You might be surprised not knowing that it even existed. Um, civic and local organization um, clubs have things that if you've been a member or your, your parents are a member or the student's been a member, religious organizations, um, and then the private listservs, as Mr. Borcher is going to talk about in a little bit more detail um, in a second, are what you know what you kind of think of as finding scholarships outside. And then we have the grants. Okay, so there's a federal Pell grant. This again is solely based on need. Yes. I just want to back up one minute on this. I yes. Have a on scholarships. Okay. If you are, um, I mean, if those scholarships are based truly on merit. Mm -hmm. On grades or, or test scores. Mm -hmm. Do you still need all the math for the test? Yes. Is it still based on the yes. on level? Yes. yes. So 99% of the colleges that award merit based aid that are maybe based on your daughter's dance ability. Okay, so you're thinking, well, it doesn't matter what we make or what we have to give. There still is a system within which financial aid is awarded, and so 99% of those colleges are still going to require that you are filling out the FAFSA. We get this a lot at Chaminade. Well, I'm not going to fill out the FAFSA. We're not going to qualify for any need-based aid. And that might be the case for a good portion of you, but a good portion of you will also have students that will qualify for merit-based aid. And so our answer is always going to be, you should fill out the FAFSA and let them decide. Okay, the worst thing that happens is you've spent an afternoon filling out the FAFSA and maybe being a little stressed out, but in my opinion, it is well worth it. Yes. Quick question. Yes. The FAFSA you say in January, senior year, are they looking at, let's say it was this year, were they looking at 2012? Yes. So the FAFSA that I'm filling out in January is for the 2013 Next, year. next January. Yes. So yes. you have to get your taxes done. Yes. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. So let me move on, and then if we don't answer at the end, because we have a lot more of it, so I'm thinking we're going to answer some of these. Okay. And then I just want to touch on grants, which, again, are need-based. There is the federal Pell Grant that comes from the federal government, and, again, that is need-based. And then in California, we have the Cal Grant, um, which, again, 
has a need-based and also has a criterion of GPA, um, which is 3.0 to qualify, and then there's another one that has lower, but... So th this is a pretty uh, technical thing, but those are some things. So the, the Cal Grant is due on March 1st, typically, and that is something that is easy to do, takes two seconds, and so if you think your student qualifies um, as a senior, this is for seniors, um, then we will send out reminders to you and to them as well that this is due. Um, okay, I said that all that, and I'm going to turn the time over to Mr. Fuller, who's going to talk about the ever dreaded student loans. No, I love loans. I'm still good friends with Sally. Her and I are buddies. I love I just want to let you know this PowerPoint will be posted on the counseling website on Blackboard by tomorrow or by the end of the day. So you don't have to worry about it. You can come back and look at it later if you wish. Okay. Alright, so there's a variety of different loans, and each one has its positives, and some have just a ton of negatives. Um, and each also varies in the amount of um, award that you can receive. And you'll see as I kind of go through, some of them start out very low. To give a low limit at the beginning and then as your student goes freshman to sophomore and then into junior and senior year they allow the number to increase because they think that the longer that they're in college the more likely they are going to graduate the more likely they're going to graduate the less likely they're going to default so we definitely don't want anyone to default um, the first loan you may see is the federal Perkins loan it is need based and it is a federal loan which means that as Californians, you are at an automatic disadvantage because the amount of wage that you make here compared to the amount of wage you make in, say, Indiana or Alabama is completely different for the living expenses, right? So a typical, even say, teaching job here is almost double what some states make um, otherwise. So their ability to get federal loans in other states, and I know this because I'm from New Mexico and we qualify is because of the federal and not the California limits. Um, you notice the interest rate is 5%. That's actually pretty reasonable for a loan. Um, and it does say interest will not accrue while students in school. Typically on these loans, so on the federal purposes and then on another loan, they get until six months after they graduate. So if they graduate in May, they have until that November time and then they have to start paying off their loans. Okay, the federal direct staffer loans are going to be your two most popular loans. The first one is subsidized. <coughs> subsidized simply means that while your child is in school, the federal government will pay off the interest. Pretty sweet deal, actually. Now, on the subsidized loans, they do limit the first, second, and second years to pretty low limits, usually around $2,500 total because that way they're kind of protecting their own interests. But as you keep going through junior and senior year, they can raise it to um, about five or $6,000, depending on the uh, school and the state of the economy. Um, repayment does begin six months after graduation. And for both of these loans, it is your student's loan. It is not your loan. Yes, you are co-signing, but when you do do these loans, please emphasize to your student, it is their fiscal responsibility to pay off their loans, right? They're getting it in their names, it's their education. And then you have the unsubsidized staff loan. So really, if, if the subsidized one does not quite meet the need, then they'll bring in the unsubsidized one. Um, it is non-need based, um, and interest does accrue while in college. It is a small amount of interest, but typically, if you pull about $10,000 by the end of the four years, you're paying about $13,000 and you haven't even started yet, okay? And as anyone who owns a house or a car or anything like that knows, interest builds up pretty quickly. Um, so on an unsubsidized loan, you can expect to pay about $1.80 for every dollar you pulled. So just kind of think about that. If you pay it off over the 10, 10 years, they typically get Okay, federal direct, oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. These are actually, in terms of student loans, actually pretty good compared to um, what the others offer. All right, the federal direct parent plus loan. 
So this is where you sign off with your son or daughter to take the loan in your name as well. Okay? It's not need based does require um, approval of your credit because your son or daughter probably has zero credit. Um, and then repayment begins 60 days after final disbursement, which basically just means 60 days after that final payment. Um, not to get morbid or anything, but generally speaking with the staffer loans, the loans on the previous page, if your son or daughter would die before they paid off their loans, they or you as the family do not owe that money again. It is their loan, as I said. But with the Parent PLUS loan, if they choose to default, if they can't pay it, or whatever, you still have to pay off their loan regardless. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, the Parent PLUS loan really has a very high limit. I think you can pull up to $20,000, $30,000 a year, depending. Usually they just pull it to meet the rest of your financial need, and then you can go from there. So it can be a very expensive, very hefty loan, and it is in your name also. And then you can, if you choose not to go the federal um, school route, you can pull a private loan. That would be walking into Chase or walking into a credit union and saying, we'd like to pull a student loan. One thing to remember is that with the other loans, they allow your son or daughter to graduate first before they're expected to pay them off. With these, typically, the moment you pull them is the moment you have to start paying them back. So it's just like uh, pulling equity on your mortgage or getting a car payment. You have to pay it right away. And then federal work study. This is a pretty good program. Um, it basically amounts to a part-time job to where your son or daughter will work at the college. I worked in the library, I'm sure some of the other counselors did wherever, I'm sure you, there you go, Mrs. Gallup worked in the library as well. There you go. <laughs> so the nice thing is, is basically at the beginning of a semester, college wants the balance to be zero. This way they're allowing the balance to be anywhere from $500 to $2,000 depending on the school and depending on the uh, job you would have. And then as they work, Every two weeks or every month, depending on the pay, they go and walk into the business office, they hand you a paycheck, sign the paycheck, and you hand it right back to them. It's a wonderful process. You go, oh, still not getting paid yet. Awesome. Now, each college awards it differently, and it depends on the school. Um, some schools, like I said, have higher limits on that, some have much like, lower limits. It really just depends on the opportunities they have and how much they're willing to pay per hour. Okay, so the, yes. Is that generally better than just taking a regular on-campus job and then just paying for it? Uh, it depends. I mean, my, myself, I actually decided to just go and get a job off campus, and I made a lot more money, and I was able to pay everything off much easier. But then what I did is instead, I had a savings account, and I put in as much as I would need for the work study for that next semester, and then I'd walk in at the beginning of the semester, pay out my work study, and then I would have to have an on-campus job. And then I had a little bit more spending cash. Yeah, so if your son or daughter wants to have a part-time off-campus job, more power to them as well. Just make sure that they can balance everything. Um, so the sources of financial aid, of course, the federal government, that's gonna be your primary source for the workers' loans and whatnot. Um, with that, you have to complete FAFSA every single year. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, states usually have residency requirements, so that's Cal Grant. Um, colleges and universities, as we, as Mrs. Calgill already talked about, there is um, merit and need based aid, depending on the student and the school. And then, of course, you have private sources. Uh, Mr. Fortune will talk about it as well. With senior parents, about every week you should be receiving an email from me with five or six scholarships that your son or daughter should be able to qualify for. A lot of them are just little essays. There's some if you're really tall or some if you're really short. <laughs> there's there's a, a whole vast array of them. Um, so some of them are really not difficult to get. You just have to hope you actually see um, or that lucky lottery number pulled, if you will. Okay, how to apply. So, <coughs> FAFSA, as we call it, it is the free application for federal student aid. 
If you are ever asked when filling out a FAFSA form to pay for something, you are on the wrong website. <laughs> and you are giving your credit card information to someone that is probably going to try to ruin your credit. So it should be a free application. It's actually relatively easy at this point. It's all electronic. There is even a way now, and it's not on here, but they actually match you up to your tax forms. You enter in your social security numbers, they link everything together, it auto fills out, and call it a day. All right, so general student info, have to have your social security number. Um, they do need to be US citizens generally. And then for the males, um, if they have turned 18, they should have registered with the selective service. Family info, they basically take your tax, your income, and other financial information, any assets, um, and if you are a dislocated worker, they do take that into account as well. Like Mrs. Calgill said, it maybe takes an afternoon or so. You can start filling it out January 1st, maybe wait until the 3rd or 4th, that's okay. Um, if you do not have all of your specific information, and I think this kind of answers the questions you were wanting to ask. If you do not have everything, estimate as close as you can. Take your final December paycheck stub, um, information from last year, if your job income is pretty much the same. Get as close as you possibly can and submit. You can always go back in and make adjustments and resubmit to those schools. The idea is being in the line to get the bowl of soup. Once you're in that line, even if you make adjustments, the soup will still be there as long as you're close to the front. Does that make sense? All right. So some of you will have special circumstances and they run the gamut. Um, call FAFSA. More than welcome to talk to us, but our responses will probably be call FAFSA because we do not know the answer to that. Um, Change in employment status, medical expenses, death of a parent, um, are some of the special circumstances that you can talk about. Um, I don't know why that's on there. Okay. All right. Frequently asked questions. My taxes won't be completed until April. That's pretty typical, right? April 15th is the deadline, and I'm sure many of you walk into the post office at uh, 11.59 and hand it in, or they do it online. Um, like I said, if you have not completed, you'll just indicate that you will file. Basically, you're stating that this is as close as I could get right now, and once I file, I will then change it. Um, once you have uh, completed your taxes, be sure to update your FAFSA as well, and then just realize that your EFC, your expected family contribution, may change depending on um, if there are any drastic differences between what you did as you will file and then what you did as you have filed. Will my financial awards be the same every year? Uh, it could, but it could not. It all depends on the previous year's financial occurrences. Um, so private business owners, if you had a rough year before, you'll probably get a lot of financial aid the next year, and then if you have a great year that year, it'll go back down again. So it really depends. Um, and it is a variety of different factors, um, students in school, family size, everything like that. Okay, and then to end it, Mr. Portrait's going to talk about some of the typical grants and scholarship programs that our students see. Yes? Just a, just a quick question, this is kind of a one of the level question on FAFSA. There is uh, something connected to it about getting a PIN, a PIN. Correct. And that you can do now, and I did. You can. And I'm sure. not quite sure what the use of that is. Maybe sure. Your, your PIN language. is basically your electronic signature. Okay. Yeah. So you're indicating to them, because everything's electronic now, so instead of having to get the papers, sign it, and mail it in, you just sign it with your PIN and you're done. It looks like you can do that now. You can get your PIN now, that is correct. A few days for it to come for them. To it, to yeah, it depends on, on when you do it, but yeah. Couple of days, couple of weeks, depending. I guess you can get it done. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to talk about some other options out there. Um, one is what's called WUI, okay? Western Undergraduate Exchange. What this is is there's 15 states on the western side um, that their students are eligible for WUI. Okay, WUI incorporates 
150 different uh, junior colleges and colleges that allow students to have reduced tuitions, okay, because they live in, for us here in California. Um, so there is, I couldn't tell you all 150 off the top of my head, but there are a number of schools, and, I, and if you go on the website, uh, you can definitely go on there and see which schools are part of WUI, okay? Every school is going to be a little bit different. Not everyone's going to give the same amount. Um, there's going to be a certain number at certain schools on how many people can have WUI. All right, and so what happens is when you guys are registering or you're doing your application, you're gonna, there's gonna be a box that says that you wanna be eligible for the WUI. Okay, there's no other form you have to fill out. Some schools will require you to maybe fill out a little bit more information on their application, but there's nothing at the WUI site with this program in general, okay? So when you apply, you mark it, and typically you're gonna get that. Uh, if, if, if it isn't a school that has a very limited number of movie slots. Does that make sense? Okay. So, this is one option, okay? And what this allows law students to do is to attend out-of-state schools for almost in-state tuition. So this is a very helpful thing for some families that are like, well, we don't, we let our kid go out of state, our kid wants to go out of state, that's just too much money. Well, let's, make, let's look and see if that school is part of Louis and let's see about them going there and, and getting some help from them, okay? So, uh, this is another example. This is Oregon State and Alabama. Uh, they're obviously not part of WUI, um, but what we wanted to show you here is that a lot of schools or institutions will have different programs for their students, a lot of times based off of merit, that allow students to go to their schools uh, for near in-state tuition or even less, okay? so. We always encourage you guys, let's look at some of the options of different schools that are not in California, all right? And let's see what kind of programs they have. And if your student's doing very well academically, you can see that it, it does dramatically cut down the cost of their school. All right, but this is just another example of, you know, outside of California, there are other options that do make it a little bit less. Um, frequently asked questions, how do I find other forms of aid? So we did allude to the, the scholarships, um, the private scholarships, and a whole bunch of other things like that. And we tell you about all this, and I'm sure some of you think, well, how do I find this stuff? How do I know if my kid's eligible for it? So we have a lot of links on our website um, on Naviance, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know about. If any of you in here are freshman parents, we will be getting to that with you guys and the, your students second semester. Uh, but Naviance pr provides a lot of great information. I'll show you some, um, some screenshots of that site and where you can find it. The other place is on Blackboard. Now I know you guys don't have your own login information, but please talk with your, your kids and get their login information. And you can go to the counseling page on Blackboard and under external links, we have tons of links to different places, including FAFSA, a lot of the financial aid, in addition to the scholarships, um, grants, Ameritase search, there's a lot of other links there. So that's a great place to go to start your search. All right, so it's kind of hard to see, I'm sorry about that. Uh, what this is, this is a picture of our Blackboard, like I was just telling you, and some of the links that are available to you there. So you can see at the very top, there's FAFSA, uh, we got the Cal Grant link right there, we have the WUI, down here is Merit Aid and Scholarship Search, okay? Why is it getting oh, okay. right at the screen? I was like, what's going on? We <laughs> touched I know, it's a touch screen. I didn't know it was. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we also have right down here FASWA. This is a great search for you guys to search the, that abundance of scholarships out there. People have free money that no one uses. What you do is you go onto this site in addition to the scholarships.com and what you're basically doing is you're creating a profile for your student. It's a great idea to have your student fill it out um, where they put in all the information about themselves and what this, these programs do is they will then search the database of scholarships. Okay, and it'll kick back the scholarships that your student might be eligible for. All right, and 
And so what you'll do is you'll get an email, hey, look at this scholarship, hey, look at this scholarship. And as time goes on, your profile will stay in there. And every time a new scholarship comes up, it will email you a notification and give you the link and whatnot for that particular scholarship. All right? It's never too early to start doing this. Have your students, if you're a freshman parent in here, have your students do it now. And then over time, they might build up all these applications that they're sending for the scholarships. And these scholarships can add up. You don't just get one. Okay, so some scholarships are going to be worth $500. Some might be worth $10,000. And so if they get three scholarships of $500, hey, that's $1,500 that you don't have to worry about. You never have to pay back. They can put it towards the books, whatever. Okay, so scholarships can add up, and it's never too early to start looking into those. Don't wait until you're a second semester junior, because you might be limited. All right, because there are some scholarships that are only for freshmen, only for sophomores, only for first semester juniors. Okay, so start taking a look early. Okay, this next one is on Naviance. Okay, so I was telling you guys on Naviance, we do have some other searches. I didn't do that one. So, down here, you're going to have a little typical stuff down here. You're going to say, see where it says scholarships and money. Okay, so we have some different links there. This is also what we're going to be putting. Anytime any of us hear about scholarships, we're going to be putting them on Naviance. You'll get a little notification. Hey, so-and-so added this scholarship to the database. And you can come in here and you can search the database and see what's available. Um, and for this little slide, this is a bunch of the, the scholarships that we have up there. Okay, and then over here, it might be hard to see, we have deadlines. So a lot of these scholarships have deadlines. Okay, so there are times where you might find a great scholarship, but the deadline was last month. Sorry, I got to look. All right. Uh, we have how much the scholarships are worth. So some of these are like $1,500, $1,000. 500, um, and whatnot, and then we'll have over here if it's merit based, okay, if it's need based, and these X's, students like to look at these, these are ones that require an essay, okay. Uh, you might get your students more likely to apply to some of them that don't require the essay. Uh, however, sometimes the ones that are going to be worth the most money are going to require an essay because they're a little bit more selective, obviously. Okay, so this will just give you a heads up on what they require. Um, let's see, what was that last one? Service. Service required. So that's going to be if they're heavily involved with uh, any of the community service, working in the community, maybe some of those leadership scholarships that we we're talking about. Okay, this is just a part of the scholarships. There are a lot more on here. All right, and you can also filter it. So you can filter, I only want to see merit based, or I only want to see service based. You can filter it out so you can only see the scholarships for different areas. Okay, financial aid websites. So a lot of these links are going to be on our Blackboard. If not all, I believe all of these are. Okay, so you can obviously Google search it. You're going to get it. But as Mr. Fuller was saying, if you're ever asked to spend money, you're probably on the wrong site. Okay, everything that we have on here is going to be free. All right. So keep in mind that you can always come on here, go to your um, go to your student's Blackboard. We're going to have all the links there. Yeah, and we'll post this PowerPoint too, just mm -hmm. in case we're not frantically right on this down. No. So it will be on uh, Blackboard as well. So we have a few minutes um, until nine, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. If, if we're looking at a Canadian college, this grants, loans, any of that apply or if not because it's out of right. So any, any college that is out of the country yeah. will not qualify for the Pell Grants or the Cal Grants, which are only for California colleges. But there are some, some outside scholarships will. How about federal loans? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I just uh, went to St. John's University with my older son, and they told us that there is a $5,000 scholarship uh, across the board if you graduate from a Catholic um, high school, is that normal here? Yeah. 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 St. Louis University just uh, visited us last year. Oh, I mean, last week. Mm -hmm. By the way, especially junior and senior parents, have your kids go to lunchtime visits with colleges. We can't emphasize that enough. I sat all by myself at St. Louis University rep, mm -hmm. and she was sitting there telling me that automatically they get $3,000 a year just coming out of Catholic school, but they have all this great stuff. 
scholarship opportunity there. And I was not over there to hear it. So have your yeah. kids go and meet the admissions people, shake their hand, get their card, and that's what's really the door of the But I don't want you to get the impression that every Catholic college right. offers that. Right. The Marianas schools offer, the other Marianas colleges offer very nice scholarships. Um, Shamanad in uh, Hawaii offers, and then we have many that will offer, um, it tends to not be the most selective of the Catholic colleges, like Notre Dame's not going to that Notre Dame. <laughs> yes. I have a question. You were talking earlier about the estimated family contribution, and I was talking to um, the financial aid officer at my son for college as a senior, and the, the financial aid or the family contribution is designated a certain amount, and they had a very small um, um, college grant because they figured that our name was not that great, which would be enough said that we could contribute this obscene. They left us like $25,000 to pay our mortgage. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, great. So if my son writes lots of essays and he gets lots of scholarships then, and also this, this school does not use loans. So there were, there were not any loans computed in there. That was just this one grant that I So if my son writes lots of essays and he gets lots of scholarships, we can use offset our contribution. And they said, no. They said that they will use it to offset any of his contribution, which is like, he's going to have a little you know, educational fund that his grandparents would set up for him. And then they would offset their contribution, which was a couple grand. And that was it. So, so what's, I mean, so I don't, I don't know what to do with that. I mean, so could they, what so does that mean that after that? Do you mind me asking what school this is? Because that is not typical. Have I heard? What's that? Have um, That is not typical. Because they just want their tuition paid. I, I that doesn't. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go out there and be wild and say that doesn't sound like 100 percent correct information to me. Really? Okay. Yeah. So my question would be. So okay, you might so want to talk to somebody else. Could they say, I also talk to Penn. You and Penn the same thing. They said that they would never decrease the estimated financial family contribution. They said that they would always come up with their whatever the student contribution was, whether it was for loans or work study or whatever, or their, and then it would come off of contribution, but they would never diminish the family contribution. That's not your experience. That, that has never been my experience. I'm, I'm just being totally honest with you. With merit-based merit based aid, no matter where it's coming in from, if it's coming from Haverford or it's coming from Coca-Cola or it's coming from the Elks Lodge, um, what you're choosing now, the way they distribute it might be that it's going, so if the student has an expected contribution, right. That check that comes in that's merit-based from a scholarship might go directly to your child, but then you can take it away from your child so that you're putting it in the fund. And if you if you pay twenty thousand dollars for them to go the semester, then that when that money comes in, you just have your child sign that over to you. How they distribute it might be what they're saying, not or where. Maybe it's just order preference. Maybe it's a child in it. Correct. Yeah. They also said they would take like they would give the child like. 100% up to like a couple thousand dollars. Yes. And then they split it 50-50, they did a share 50% and the child's contribution 50%. Right. And that was it. Maybe there's something different. Well, typically there, a school is always going to cover the student's expected contribution before they cover the parent's expected contribution. So maybe there's money left after school. Yes. After school That's what I'm saying. It doesn't sound right that if there's money left over, if your son is going to give it to you, then you can use it to... Right. Yeah. So I, I'm not I'm not sure that they're 100 percent giving you like the whole scenario correctly. Yes. When I was a student, my parents did not live in this country. Does that uh, separating your child from the parents somehow after they're 18, not uh, having not not uh, how do we make it independent? So if yeah. the parental financial yeah. does not affect unless they're emancipated, like. You, after after they've attended school for what two years? Okay, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult they have to, to prove, prove that they've been living without you and financially. And no financial support has been given by the family. <clears throat> they would have to have a job. They would have to so provide a, like an income statement. Be, yes. Kind of completely independent. Yeah. For undergraduate yeah. students, it's very difficult. Once you become a graduate student, the there is no more expected family contribution. So it is very different, but once yeah, undergraduate, it's very so difficult. Even if you don't claim them as dependents right. and so on, you still... If they've lived in your house and you give them money, mm -hmm. even if it's cash, <laughs> they, 
they're going to know they don't have a job. They're going to know they don't have the means to support themselves. So it's very difficult for that reason. Otherwise, everyone would do it. <laughs> um, okay. Then we're having seen the the FAFSA, what I consider this. I take it it would also take into consideration what you may have saved, let's say, in a five. 29 account. But, but does it, when it looks at the family, does it only look at the parents? In other words, if that 529 is in the grandparents' name, would it be considered as part of the whole family support? Unless you're held in trust, and, like, unless you have your name is on that account. It's only things that are linked to your social security number. Right, so, so if, if that 529 was being done by a grandparent, that, and let's say there's $300,000 in that That would not be considered in paying I support under FAFSA. I so, but you may want to talk to FAFSA or CSS profile just, you know, <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> well, no, no, but, but, <laughs> yeah, but the other thing you want to be careful of is if it's been set up in trust or set up attached to the child's name with, with that, that becomes the student's expected contribution. Okay. And so that can increase the student's part in it. It may decrease yours, but it will increase theirs. Okay. So just be careful. Yes? On that same line, if you file your notes account against you when you actually apply for financial aid, is that retirement? If you're looking at America's application, I think it depends on how you set uh, set it up. Is it you're paying taxes ahead of time or before? Or, uh, you know, generally speaking, on the retirement. I mean, this is just really generalization, but generally speaking, your retirement assets, like the four hundred one k plan. And even your kids' IRA, if they opened one day and they were working summer jobs, that's protected from considering to And depending on your age as a parent, like if you're uh, over a certain age, like 50 something, as it says on this sheet, um, then there's a certain amount of those 529 plans are sheltered too. But not all that $300,000 example, you're not going to ship. You're not going to shelter that. <laughs> Some part of the she knows what she's talking <laughs> yeah. No, no, but they ask very specifically on the form, and they will list every account that you have to disclose. So it's pretty clear on what they're asking you to disclose. If a child has a grandparent who is willing to pay some of the college costs, there's nothing to keep the grandparent from writing a check for your child's housing or books or something else. Just not where it's tied to their social security. Yes. Can I elaborate a little bit more on the Sure. 529 is basically a college savings plan, and in some cases, the grandparents included, depending if they put it in their social security name, they have a list of beneficiary. And usually, it's a grandchild or multiple grandchildren. That beneficiary can also be transferred to a sibling or whomever. The caveat with 529 is you must distribute that money at a certain point in time for higher education. If you don't, um, ultimately, put the tax on the remainder. So what happens is, you can take the money out, um, the effort to file it on your tax return. So the child, if they're 18 and they're beneficiary, they can put it on their tax return. If the parents are being so high that they're not going to get benefit of a college tuition, um, it, you know, it, it's kind of on your financial situation when you're tax return. Yeah, and that's why, again, it's just always best to ask the person that's most familiar with your particular financial setups. Just a general question. Do, do they take into consideration the FAFSA? Do they take into consideration the number of dependents you have? Or do they just look at the big number at the bottom and don't take into account this family has two kids, this other family has four, because your financials are quite different? Yes. Yes. It's family size. And then the other thing that we didn't even really mention here, there's something called the CSS profile that is primarily used by uh, private schools. And so that is additional information to the FAFSA. And they actually consider the number of students that you have in college at one time. So if you have 
not scare anyone, but we had I, we had six kids in college at one time between my husband and I, between graduate and undergraduate, and four of them bang, 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 bang. So by the time the youngest one went, he was almost free. <laughs> so, so because because those all we had three kids in undergraduate education. When that applied, our expected family contribution was, was almost nothing because of that. So the CSS profile takes that into consideration where the FAFSA does not. So the FAFSA does not. The FAFSA is more general. It will it will your expected family contribution will be depend will be hinged on your dependents and that obviously you have a dependent on the support, but it's not as detailed as the CSS profile. Correct. Uh, it's 9 o'clock, so to respect those of you who have to go to work, we're going to stop our formal presentation at this point. We will be down here if you have questions. Uh, let us know. Any of you park uh, in the parking lot behind me, drive up the driveway all the way around.